this evening. This evening, um, something a little different. Yep, yeah. that's fine. Not a problem. Um, we do have Bree um, around base. She is this. Excuse me. She is with us um, by Zoom or out on the computer. She's not with us here in person, but she is here with us. So, hi, Bree. by John, seconded by Gina to approve um, the consent agenda as is. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 7-0. Thank you. Okay, next we have Kelly Larson um, with the Neighborhood Revitalization Plan and her letter is in agenda number two. So we will turn that over to Kelly. Thank you. And I guess I just could make one clarification on the agenda. I'm now Kelly Gorley. <laughs> so, congratulations. <laughs> that's going to be uh, different to get used to. It. That's the first time I've officially said it. So, uh, anyway. Um, so, uh, just a little bit of background. Um, back in 2000, uh, the city of Lincoln and also Sylvan Grove approved a neighborhood revitalization program. And it's been renewed ever since then, pretty much every four years, from my understanding. There's a lot that happened before my time. But um, it seemed to me like the, really the last 10 years is when property owners were actually applying and utilizing the program. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background, so the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, um, it's a way to try and encourage property owners within the city limits to try and improve their properties. Um, I don't think that there's any secret, or I don't think too many people could argue that we do have some properties that are in need of some major improvements. And um, one thing that I hear all the time is the complaint about taxes. And I mean, I think we've all heard it a million times, um, you know, and everybody can say that the taxes are high, and I don't think anybody could argue with that either. You know, it's always higher than, than we uh, want it to be. But the idea is to try and at least mitigate that concern a, a little bit. And so um, the idea, if somebody is making a substantial improvement to their property, and by substantial that means they're putting at least $20,000 into their property, and that improvement increases the value by 20%, um, then they would qualify for this neighborhood revitalization um, property tax rebate. Um, on that 20,000, 20%, uh, it's pretty easy to spend $20,000 in improvements on a house. It's hard to get that 20% um, improvement value. Uh, just because you replace your roof doesn't necessarily mean the value of the house is going to go up. 
or you put new siding on or something like that. This is something where you're really making improvements that, that's going to impact the property's value. Um, so, and then the property tax rebate, um, it essentially works that it's a rebate on the increased value of the property. So in the letter that I included to you, I kind of made up an example using very easy math. But if you have a property that's worth $100,000, you put a bunch of money into it, and afterwards it's worth $150,000, you still are paying, actually you're paying taxes on whatever the increase is on that entire amount, um, but you're rebated the increase based on that $50,000 increase. They're not being rebated any property taxes on that original $100,000 value, it's just that increased value. Um, so over the past, um, again, the program has been in existence for uh, since 2000, but I really think um, it's been since 2010 that people have seen um, utilize the program. And since then, there's been 30 um, properties that have utilized it. Um, three have been removed from the program for uh, delinquent taxes. Um, so if you aren't a good taxpayer, <laughs> then you get disqualified from the program. Um, 12, have, 12 properties have gone through the successful 10 years, and um, the first couple years is 100% rebate on that increased value. Uh, a couple years later, it drops down to 75%, a couple years after that, 50%, 25%. And so after um, that 11th year, you are no longer getting any rebate. So 12 properties have gone through that. Um, three more will be um, completing that here in this property tax calendar year. Um, 11 um, are somewhere in the cycle, whether they're, they're two years left or nine years left. And then one just started this, this year, so they've got the full 10 years to go. Um, and just to give you an idea, well, I'll back up. So the, the property tax rebate, um, the idea is that all the different taxing authorities kind of combines their efforts together to, to maximize the benefit to the property owner, to make this really um, something that they feel is an incentive. Um, so, uh, back in August, the city of Lincoln started the renewal process, so they voted to let's, let's begin the process. So now the school and the county commission, as taxing authorities, um, need to or can't have the opportunity to sign on, uh, approve or, or not approve. Um, and then if both uh, the school and the county does, then the, the city would continue on with the process and, and basically by the end of the year, um, have everything wrapped up. And, and the current neighborhood revitalization program um, expires at the end of the year. Um, so let's see what else we got here. Um, so in 2019, just to give you an idea of what that dollar amount is to the school, um, the school's value of that rebate was $5,346.50. That bounces around a little bit, um, depending on what kind of property improvement comes on in that, that first year and therefore has a 100% rebate of, of whatever their value is or what you know, property might drop out of the program. So looking back on, on the numbers that I got, you know, it's kind of bounced around from, um, I think about 8,000 was the high that I've seen to maybe the 4,000, but it seems like in the five and 6,000 range is where you're pretty consistent in terms of what is the annual rebate of the, sc the school's portion of the annual rebate. So that just gives you an idea of what, what we're kind of talking about from the school's perspective. Um, but yes, it is the school, you are foregoing uh, revenue um, for the sake of the community and should try to spur uh, property improvements um, so I know that you guys are under a crunch. <laughs> the schools are always under a crunch, and I can't imagine that with everything going on right now, um, it's any easier. I, I have to imagine it's just exponentially more difficult. Um, so something like this, I do uh, appreciate I mean, that we are talking about the school uh, rebating um, taxpayer dollars back. Um, but the way I look at it is you know, we're kind of trying to play the long game. Um, the more properties that are improved, um, the better our, our property tax values are. Hopefully that means um, you know, some vacant houses can become occupiable, and that means that there's a family in there, um, or you know, a, a building downtown is improved, and now we've got a new business in there. Um, something along those lines. So um, yes, it is in the short term, um, the school foregoing uh, 
property taxes, but hopefully in the long term, um, we kind of see the, the rewards from that. And let's see, what I put that in here? Um, since the NR Neighborhood Revitalization Program was created, um, there's been a little over $2 million in uh, increase in property values based on the, the um, pro properties that have been part of the program. So, you know, that does, that does add up. Um, I think that's kind of the gist of it. You've got the draft um, plan in front of you. This is not substantial. This hasn't changed at all, uh, other than the dates, basically, from what um, has been approved before. Um, and then you also see the application um, that property owners fill out. Um, and then you also have the interlocal agreement that would be signed between the city, the school, and the county if, if um, this is approved. So with that, is there any questions? Is that, um, not obvious to update, but is that for new construction if somebody wants to come in and build a brand new house? It can be for new construction. Um, it can be for renovations of existing properties. It can be for additions onto buildings, and it can be totally new construction. Um, it is not for if you're just adding on um, or building a, a, a garage. Mm -hmm. It's not for a swimming pool. It's not for a, you know a shed or something like that. It really has to be kind of a um, substantial kind of to the house, I guess you could say, or the commercial property. Um, I think it can be used if you convert a garage into um, livable space. That that qualifies. Um, but it's not for if you build a garage off somewhere else on your property. So there are some stipulations that way. Yeah. What's that? I think it has to be part of the home. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Kelly? What's your, what's your deadline for meeting approval? This was on your agenda as an information slash action. If it's something you wanted to take action on since it's happened in the past, or if you want to sit on it, what's the timeline? Um, we do have a little bit of time, so you know if you guys are aren't comfortable making a decision tonight, that's fine. Um, you can sit on it. Probably next month, though, is I would need to have a decision just to get it to the city um, for them to make the decision, get everything kind of done before the end of the year. Um, so I've got kind of my the wish list. You know, if everything kind of moves slow. slow uh, moves along, um, but we do have about a month in, in a Google room to meet it. Okay. Would you like me to get doc more documentation to you? Anything else? I think mm -hmm. it's been done forever. I don't know why we're mm -hmm. going to do it so that she can yeah. So just for the clarification, you said that it's for the increased amount of value you get 100% of the Right. But right. you also mentioned new construction. So Right, so uh, as an example, like let's say the free land program out here. Um, you know, it's a vacant lot, so again, for easy math purposes, like the taxes on that are $200 a year. I don't know, I don't know if that's right or not. Um, what's that? At zero. At, oh, okay, yeah. 2000 <laughs> um, But then you build a big new house, and now the property taxes go from 5000 so from 2000 to 5000 um, then they still are paying the property taxes on the 2000 Nothing's rebated there, but it's the rebate on that increased 3000 But actually, the house itself is built. Yeah, so the house, an entirely brand new house, all of that counts towards yeah. the improvements, so all of that would be part of the rebate. Thank you. Bree, do you have any questions for Kelly? No, I don't. So um, with that, um, is there any discussion that we need to take? All right, so you have a motion to accept the Neighborhood Revitalization Plan as Kelly presented. I so move. Thank you, David. I'll second. Thank you, Gina. Motion by David, seconded by Gina to approve the Neighborhood Revitalization Plan as presented. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven oh. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate your time.
we do have a substantial amount of it in sanitation and disinfection and stuff like that. It can be moved around, so we're kind of just playing the game right now, seeing where we are, what we're having to do, what are our needs. It does have to be spent by the end of December, so we're on a timeline with that. Uh, that original CARES money, that ESSERF money that was last year, that is still able to be spent ongoing through, I think it's September of 22. So we're, we're parking that and waiting to see what happens in the future. So that's the COVID update. It, it, it's exciting. Yeah. It's good news for us. All right, very good. Any questions? Any discussion? All right, so we will move on to the LTA Memorandum of Understanding, and that's the Denver number three. This was the memorandum of understanding that I sent to you because of our changing schedules. The negotiated agreement states that teachers get 45 minutes of plan time every single day, but as we move to block scheduling to help with social distancing and transition periods, teachers don't get a 45 minute plan every single day. So with the hiccups in the scheduling due to COVID, the KASB recommended that we just have this memorandum of understanding that says, Weekly plan time, or in a two-week cycle for a block schedule, will be the equivalent of 45 minutes a day. Uh, it was presented to LTA, and we do have documentation that they approved it. So now we just need to approve it here, and that will get us through this year. It is something that probably should go in the language of the negotiated agreement, just so it doesn't have to be revisited either 45 minutes a day or equivalent plan time, and then. We don't have to go back and forth with MOUs on situations like that because I know we were going to start the year with modified block at the high school. It wouldn't have worked then. Then we went to full block to keep the hallways less populated so it didn't work there. And now we can get legal with the negotiated agreement with this memorandum of understanding. Some of the comments that were made is not just the high school teachers that the block schedule affects, it affects the playing time of the grade school too. And I have to think about the teachers that are traveling back and forth and how that will affect them too. So it's definitely a district wide issue. So, all right, very good. Um, any questions? Okay, I have a motion to approve that as presented. I move that we approve the memorandum of understanding with the LTA. Motion by Deb. Thank you, TJ. Motion by Deb, second by TJ. The USB 298 Board of Education approved the Lincoln Treasure Lincoln Teachers Association Memorandum of Understanding concerning teacher plan time for the 2021 school year. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. Thank you. Um, next, the educational broadband frequency issue. This is a little out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have asked Brenda to try to explain this. Yes. Um, we're talking about our educational broadband, um, our AIR, the 2.4 gigahertz. We talked about it a few years ago for some of you board members that were on. Um, Select Spectrum had a webinar we watched again, and I have a Wednesday morning phone call with him. He will be talking to us about our options for leasing, selling, um, or what we want to do with that. Um, the FCC has changed the rules on that that allows us to lease it or sell it, and um, apparently there's quite a market for that. So we probably just, after I talked to him, um, like last time we signed an agreement that they can represent us in looking um, in the market for um, people that want to lease or purchase. Um, I think it's just a, a motion to enter into an agreement with them. I don't know if you want to wait until after Wednesday morning when I talk to him, or I don't know. There needs to be a motion tonight. My, my limited knowledge on this thing is you don't want your frequency to go away. You don't right. want to lose it because it's very, very difficult to get one back. 
So we already have it. We need to figure out a way, if, if there's a way to turn it into a revenue source. We did back yes. in the early 2000s. We leased it and we did receive a check once a year and then that kind of stopped and, and now we're back to that again. So. I thought we did it uh, a few years ago. We didn't, we years ago. Ago. We didn't, oh, have, any, we didn't have any bids. Why do I remember that we did that before? Yeah. We did, we did. Nobody, nobody, bid, nobody on bid on it. Okay. And what was the lease agreement with them? They are leasing it up for us and what is their cut on that? Do you have any I don't. I don't know yet. I'll find out right. Wednesday morning. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so if you want to wait until after I have that discussion to approve it, um, you can see what our options are. Or Get as much money as you can. How long do we have, Brenda? I, I don't know until after Wednesday. When I talk to him, I'll know more. Okay. But I don't get a special meeting or wait until the next board meeting? I'll, I'll find out. Okay. I'll, let you, I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> it's at 8 o'clock in the morning, so I'll let you, um, I'll let Mr. Crenshaw know, and then he can let you know um, a summary of our discussion. and. Since they had it last time and didn't obtain any bids, are there other vendors out there too that do the same thing? Type of services soliciting? Nobody has reached out, and, and I, I don't know. Um, but they just offered this webinar on it. And okay. I, I get emails from them quite quite. Yeah. So I just want to find Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Any other questions for Brenda? two different lunchrooms that we serve from, but it seems to be working really well. Uh, for students, it's a very fun adventure, I will say that. And we've had a field trip already. We're planning another one for October. We met today to talk about all sorts of parent and community engagement activities. We could start with kids. For example, our students will be running the mile Thursday, um, actually at the building, and parents can come out and watch that as long as they stay outside the fence line. So we're just really happy to be back, and things are going really well. I don't have really too much more than to say than that. It's it's the the energy you feel when students are in the building is is indescribable. Uh, last spring when school shut down, it was just it was kind of eerie. But when the kids are back, it's just it, it's there's just energy you can't explain. So it's good to have them back. Activities are going good so far. Um, they're enjoying having their time to play, and coaches are doing a really good job of uh, making every moment fun because you just never know when it's going to be over. So they're really enjoying their time and their activities. Um, homecoming's coming is this week, so that's another thing that you have to deal with when you talk about COVID and social distancing. And so um, we decided not to have a dance right now. We're going to postpone it so maybe things settle down. But we're trying to do everything else as we have in the past, except we're not going to have the pep rally at the elementary school. We're going to have it at the football field. Um, still going to have a parade downtown, but instead of going, we'll go by the um, elementary school, but then we'll end up at the football field. So. What time is the parade? Two. Two. <laughs> is it going to be a regular dismissal then on Friday? Probably. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I have a couple questions. Yeah. But that's all we got. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Finchaw, your turn. Okay, I'll batter up. Oh, no. <laughs> all right. I may be the windy one tonight. <laughs> I have what seems like a, a lot of information to share with you, but I would start off first with some celebrations, just to keep everything exciting and upbeat. Um, we were told just this week. Mm -hmm. on Dollar General that we got a $3,000 early literacy grant 
that will go towards second grade Chromebooks. That's a pretty big deal. Um, even bigger deal is from the Bear Fund, and you can see the check behind Patty down there. America's Farmers Grow Rural Education Grant, the $15,000 for the plasma cutter at the high school. And if you've never seen a programmable plasma cutter, when it gets set up, we're going to have to have a demo. Because I should have brought my sign with me that was made as a departing gift from where I came from, but the possibilities are endless with this machine. So it's pretty exciting. Tomorrow at nine o'clock, there's a check accept or a check accepting ceremony kind of a thing. And if two or three, I've got a couple of emails. If two or three of you want to be there, can't have four, then it's a meeting. But if a couple, three people want to show up, we're going to be behind the shop, mm -hmm. um, having a little check ceremony, presenting that. And the farmers that nominated us are going to be there. Is my understanding? Just a neat little time to celebrate that win. Because that's, that's a pretty big win there. Mm -hmm. So, did anybody want to commit? I'll come. 9 o'clock? I can unless somebody else wants to. I'm not sure if I can. Okay. So if somebody else knows that you can. I'll try. You'll try. Okay. <laughs> yes. If you're going to go, just let me know. Oh, okay. And then I'll go. And then we'll oh, have a I'm, I'm a maybe. Oh, okay. So there's a two definite, and if you guys want to communicate, just yeah, to keep I'll, it. Okay. Check with my aim. Okay. Awesome. Because that's kind of me, too. <laughs> Make sure I can get out for a few minutes. So. so those are two big deals. The other good news is kind of what we said before with the COVID update. Uh, our staffing is back to 100%. Our students are in classrooms. Activities are happening. Uh, there's a lot of, of energy, and, and I, I really enjoy being in the buildings. So I, I was able to spend time in Mrs. Z's third grade class and answer a ton of questions. And you got to love third graders because the first one was, how old are you? <laughs> so that was uh, sobering to say the least. Uh, yeah. I told him I had hair and no white whiskers when I came here. Uh, but it was fun. I got to read a book to him. The kids are just awesome. And, uh, you know, if you guys want to get out and about, get a hold of, of a building administrator and go in and see what's going on. It's fun. Just put your head in and see, see what our staff is doing with these kids. It's, it's cool. I try to get in the buildings as much as I can. Um, today, there was a, I don't want to call it an emergency Zoom meeting, but Randy Watson sent an email out Friday and, and said we need to have a Zoom meeting today at 1230, which is off schedule for our typical superintendent Zooms. And there have been some updates to remote learning expectations. Uh, the, if you want me to explain them to you, I don't know that they'll mean anything has to do with the student log and the yeah, time and hours spent. Anymore. We we now are requiring an assurance document from parents that will take the place of the actual time logs and the parent is making the commitment to make sure that the learning takes place and supply the support that the student needs. So that is a big change in the remote learning model. Um, so any of the students, the, the few that we have, uh, they'll be contacted by administrators. And the biggest key is that we have daily, meaningful teacher contact with the student. And that's the attendance count that we're going to be banked on now. So interesting stuff. Um, again, probably good we don't have 20,000, 30,000 kids in the district. Those are probably the ones that we're finding themselves completely overwhelmed with weekly time cards. So, that, going forward. Okay, well, I'd like to say that's why, well, I don't want to say that's the end of the good news, but what we're going to talk about now is a lot of opportunities. And, and that is just as exciting as the good news. Because if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you need to go. So I would like to share with you, I spent a week ago Friday up in Topeka with Craig Ninesmonder and Dale Dennis talking about funding, it's my second trip up there because I have concerns and they have concerns. And I sent you information in Friday notes from Craig Ninswander's email to me 
because I asked him to recap our conversation so that it was straight from the horse's mouth. Um, most of the time, in communities, a school district is really perceived as, you're fine. Or a new superintendent coming to town is perceived as, oh, it's the new guy, they always say there's no money because they need to save a whole bunch and look good at the end of the year. Well, I'm going to tell you, this new guy is telling you the truth. We have some financial issues. Craig, myself, and the reason I went to Topeka was to confirm mostly my concerns. And unfortunately, he said, I'm interpreting things accurately, which means I simply don't know if we can make this budget this year. It is that severe right now. We have, our, our capital outlay, as you've seen numbers, has plummeted from about 248000 to 122000 It's now at 108000 And bills just keep coming in. So, I will caution that as we move forward, again, it is necessity that drives purchasing decisions, not wants. We, I'm looking at every 10 dimes equaling a dollar. And that's kind of what we're looking at right now. We may pull even more money from what limited reserves we have to get through this year. The good news is we know exactly where we are. And now we can start planning for the future. Because without that clarity, it was just, well, things are tight. Now I have some pretty good clarity that moving forward, we'll make healthy financial decisions. So, let me share. This will work. Some information with you. Can Bree see this? She should be able to. Bree, can you see that? Oops. Yeah, it looks like it's coming up right now. Okay. There we go. Can you see that? Yep, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So, this isn't a big mystery, but I really wanted to put some, some numbers and some data to you to understand the opportunities that we have. This is FTE student count. All of this information was pulled from KSDE's Data Central through many phone calls on how to interpret all the different numbers that seem to be floating around. So this is, again, from the horse's mouth. Data Central gave me these figures to go by. Here's what's encouraging is right here. The expectation was that we were going to have a, I don't want to say significant, but a student drop for this year. We've actually increased some students. We had another one coming back today. So we're creeping up one student over where we were last year. And here's why that's good news. Because we're coming off of our three-year high for FTE enrollment counts, if we can maintain this 316, 317, we won't have to drop down to 311, which is where we were targeted to go to. It's not huge, but again, dimes make dollars, and five kids is dollars. So that funding is very, very important. This is kind of just a bar graph of the same thing, but I broke it out by building so that you can kind of see any changes. This is probably one of the most important documents that I wanted to share with you. Since 1314 through 2021 this year, I wanted to compare student numbers, district student numbers, with staffing. That's an FYI. Regardless of what our student, whatever, regardless of what our student numbers have done, we've stayed pretty steady. This is not a statistically significant piece of information. This is simply how many kids did we have in the district to how many students did we have in the district ratio. So anytime you see this decline, if the 
number of students to teacher gets lower and we're not adjusting staffing, that's just a decline in enrollment. I don't know what happened 15, 16, there was quite a spike in, in enrollment. And unfortunately, the next year there was equal and more of a decline. So I don't know what happened here historically, but we have started this trend as of 17, 18 here, and then now we're just creeping up a little bit. So this increase in student to teacher ratio is because we have a few more student bodies with that and a 0.3 reduction in staff. So those two combinations make that ratio go a higher. Rural communities were doing better in those years because the farming environment was better than during the fresh years. And since 15 has been better. That makes sense. And wonder if that is something that people coming back to rural communities. This is a, I thought you would find this kind of interesting. This is a funding change year to year. So what this represents is from 1314 to 1415, there was a decrease in funding of over $40,000. From 1415, 15, 16, the big spike, we saw this great $70,000 increase in funding. Unfortunately, with that plummeting enrollment, so plummets funding. Then 16, 17 to 17, 18, it wasn't that bad. And then we increased again, losing funding. And then we've come up a little bit. So again, this is just a picture for you to kind of visualize what's going on. But how does that go away? Whatever. $228,000 in lost funding over the last six years, approximately with no significant adjustments financially to, to weather that financial storm. This is that email that I sent you. If, and this is the huge if right now, if the FTE funding continues to increase by the Gannon lawsuit, these numbers will be somewhat true. If the governor is unable to manage the finances of the state without cutting education, every dollar here that gets cut will add to this deficit for next year. So this is what Craig and Dale and I worked on. $83,000 could be added to the general fund if the state can maintain K-12 funding. They have forecasted our enrollment to decline by 19. I'm wrong. I feel hopeful that we've already seen that that hasn't continued downward this year, and we'll see what happens next year. I'm hoping that's inflated. Uh, if we would lose 19 students, then we lose low enrollment weighting, we lose at-risk weighting, and we lose transportation weighting. The transportation weighting is probably coming anyway, because much like our three-year average on FTE, that runs on a cycle and it's getting refigured. So we're rolling off of 16, 17's transportation weighting, and they calculated a loss of $15,000 on transportation, regardless of what happens to enrollment. So that's better than what we had talked about before, a 71.9 deficit. We had been talking 89 and 90,000. So Again, if we don't know where we are, we don't know how to plan. So I feel better about that deficit, but it is a deficit. And it is something that we're gonna to have to address. My, my, if I were to share something just from my heart, the goal can't be to make up a $71,000 deficit. The goal has to be make significant enough changes that we get some breathing room and we actually are in a position to get money back in our 
contingency funds. If something catastrophic happens right now, we don't have the money to take care of very much. And that's, we don't need to meet our budget, we need to heal our finances. And there's a difference there. And it doesn't have to all be done in one year. But a strategic plan, a strategic financial plan would be that we do the best we can do to get everything that kids need and everything the staff needs, but we're very aware that we have to also have funds to rebuild our reserves for an emergency. Yes, sir. So if you go back to that one, what you're saying here, Judy, is that if we have the increase in funding, but in all scenarios, we are actually looking at if we don't take that into account, it's just we don't know what's going to happen to the governor. If we don't take that into account, we're about $155,000 negative. Overall, the expenses, because we are declining, is 90000 So we're only waiting 33000 That's what we're waiting, 16000 If everything will be the same, once say your finances, if we didn't get the increased funding. I can't wrap my brain around that, so I haven't looked at it that way. <laughs> but that is absolutely true. That's base increase. If, if we don't get that base state, if state they freeze, increase, we're looking at $150,000. Absolutely. If they freeze funding to this year's level, yeah. yes. Yeah, if they don't have the money to give us, mm -hmm. we're not going to get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yep. Ugly but true. So here's what I am currently evaluating. And you please give me direction if there's other places you want me to go. But we are evaluating appropriate staffing in each building. You saw those numbers and you saw our levels. We have to see what is appropriate staffing for our district and move forward from there. It's a, it's a data, it's an unemotional data-driven decision. I've already started looking into transportation. I, I talked to the Durham Bus Service. They got quite a chuckle out of my conversation with them. They won't touch anything that doesn't have 25 routes. So that being said, he was a wealth of information to just be helpful. We currently pay $434 per day per bus. And he thought that was a pretty good rate. Uh, we're looking at other options. When, I, when, when our reserve funding is going down, we have challenges if we want to bus. There's a lot of challenges there. So we're looking at some very creative options, and I'll report as I get more information on that. Uh, centralized kitchen, I think everybody knows that that needs to happen, and I, I talked at length today uh, at the high school. The time that it's going to take to get the facility ready to do that, it, it probably can't happen this year because it's also going to take money. Gas lines, new, more ovens, more capacity to basically double the production. So that's going to take more planning than just, hey, can we go ahead and move to this? So, But that's ongoing. To centralize that, to maximize labor dollars, and to minimize lunch expenses. And then the other thing that I included in one of your emails is at some point in time we will have to have a discussion on our budget authority with Supplemental General or LOB and if we want to make any moves on that. And we're at current 30? 30. 30. Is that correct? And you have the authority to go to 33. And then here are some serious areas of concern. I talked to train HVAC today. I've been working with them for about the last month uh, trying to figure out what do we do at the high school. Uh, they did a complete analysis of airflow, of air quality, of our equipment. They got blueprints of the building. They do all of this consultation work as a service, and then they help you try to find funding as a service. As a service, hoping they get business if you do something. But this part of the analysis isn't a part of it. They would help us with a strategic plan for plant, physical plant uh, operations. How do we replace these? How do we pay for these? 
how do then we budget so we're not in this pinch again. But the 24 units are 24 years old with a lifespan of 15 years. Uh, they estimated $800,000 for those 24 units to, to do that. The $50,000, they think the gym needs to be air conditioned because of air circulation and air quality. It needs to be humidified or dehumidified and it needs to have AC. And I have to tell you, I, I haven't been in a gymnasium that's not air conditioned. So when I first went to the volleyball thing, I was like, Yee! I better wear shorts next time. <laughs> the ceiling fans were just pushing very hot air down on my very bald head, you know. So, uh, but I asked them. I said, "Okay, the, the gym has never had air conditioning. Talk to me what it would save." That's the fifty thousand dollars. He said, "You probably knock fifty off for the gym. So just the roof units and getting them back eight hundred thousand dollars." That's pretty serious. That's a chunk of change. And that's why I'm saying, if these things start going out, we don't have the money to do this. And I cannot suggest or encourage that we go in debt and buy these on credit cards, which is what these purchase is. It's a credit card purchase. It's, sometimes it's a necessary evil. But that will be our only option when these things start dying. So I think that's a high priority. Um, the track, you know, I've heard all those conversations from when I was visiting in the spring. That's where I got that three to 500. That's going to be a conversation that's going to have to happen at some point is, where's that project headed? Uh, it is, I talked to Christy today, and I think she'll affirm, it is in significant disrepair. Yeah. We're going to have conversations about what can we use it for and what can't we use it for. We have to keep our kids safe. Uh, the parking lot uh, at the junior high high school it is in great need of repair. Talked about that a little bit today. I haven't reached out to anybody, but my fear is it has been neglected for so long that we can't put a cap on it. There's too many big potholes. I fear either sections are going to be have to dug out and a new compacted um, substrate. substrate underneath, or the whole thing torn out and redone. It is in terrible shape. And then the roof at the elementary school, I put that down because I was in here for discussions where they talked about styrofoam slanted roofs and things like that. <coughs> That's just, I just put it down as a concern because I know we have the leaks over there. So we can't not maintain our facilities. And a lot of this stuff, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus because I, I get the financial part of it, you know. A lot of this stuff is, is deferred maintenance that now is gonna cost a lot of money. You know, it, it's the it's the tractor that's been outside for 20 years instead of in a machine shed out of the weather kind of a thing. It's just age and exposure on most of this stuff. So I'm not saying there was ever money to throw at it, but I'm saying we have we need a plan. And that's all to do with the heating system. The school was built 24 years ago, so all the heating air units have the same age. Yes, we do have 10 units that have been replaced. And so there is a total of 40 is what they counted, but that's not what Dennis counted. But there are um, six, seven, eight, nine, there's 10 units that are less than 10 years old. And there are three different brands. Yeah. You guys probably know those. There's three trains, and then there's two brands I've never heard of that are up there. So it's not like the whole building has to be replaced. See, again, there's, there's just optimism moving forward. Some of them don't need to be replaced. Going back, sorry, the 800000 that you were estimating for the HVAC, is that the, to redo the entire system? That's not just the 24 ACs. That's the 24 ACs. That's like $50,000 dollars a piece. Yes. That's straight and from the train. I thought they were like $10,000. Yeah, we bought our units for $7,000. $7,000. Like seven, I was estimating said, yeah. For $7,000. You can put more than that. We're thinking 10000 But that was, that was, that was, that was the unit. Cow. That's what the unit. Yeah, 
this is the project. And here's the reason they're bringing this up. If there happens to be, and this is what I like working with this train about this, they have a, cons a financial consultant. And to not let a good crisis go to waste, it's a little phrase that I picked up. <laughs> if, and our, and our building would qualify for it, in this COVID age, in this virus clean air age, if they, the reason that I'm talking to them is to get these numbers in line so that we can be in the queue already and train is working with us if the feds open up money for school safety and school improvement for COVID. Another huge round of financing can go towards air quality. Is it free? No. Nah, we'll be paying for COVID for the rest of our lives. But is it the current game that's being played? Yeah. Yeah. And we, if they're playing the game, we need to go to the plate and take a pitch or two. So the reason this research is going on is, is just in case they open up some funding, we already have numbers, we already have a consultant in train, and we're already ready to apply and move forward. So what that funding would look like is anybody's guess. But if it's 50%, it's 50%. If it's 75, things are looking better. If it's 10, it's probably problematic. <laughs> But we have to be ready to go. So that's why that is. So this is what I'd like to leave you with today. Some recommendations. Given the situation that we're in, I truly think we need a well thought out, multiple input strategic plan for 298. I, bet I, I included a, a sample strategic plan. Uh, I put it at your desk there. Community members, business people, Families, parents, students, staff, administrators. Everybody has input into a district strategic plan. But what this does is give us the bullseye to shoot for. Right now, we don't know community priorities. We don't know board priorities. We don't know where to put 90% of the effort. And a strategic plan would help us understand exactly what we need to do moving forward. Um, it's like I said, it, we can't hit this bullseye if we don't have a target. So I need to get the target. And if, if that center target is HVAC, then that's what we're shooting for. If it's curriculum, that's what we're shooting for. Whatever it is, but we need to get that sort of input so that if anything comes about where we need stakeholder support, they've been a part of the process. This community understands we've been transparent, we have shared information, we've shared needs, and we've shared concerns. So let's share solutions, and let's see where everybody is on education in Lincoln, Kansas, because it's going to take everybody. Um, the other thing that I, that I wanted to do in that last point down there is just at semester, really assess our financial situation at that point comparing last year to this year, comparing percentage of budget spent, and then it's been crazy this first four weeks because it has been a spending fest because of everything that's going on. And I need to let I need to get some patterns in place so that I can analyze year prior to current year, percentage of budget spent to percentage of time left. I just don't have that data yet. It's just been not enough time. Not enough Nancy time. used to have, I don't think she did good, she used to, every quarter would bring us mm -hmm. as to where we were at, spending yep. this year versus last year, so I don't know if that was yep. kind of And she and I, that's what I say, she's such an asset because okay. she and I have talked about that, right. and as right. soon as we get a length of time that gives us some accuracy, mm -hmm. she's going to start generating that for me more frequently. Uh, we might want to look at it every month given our situation. Every board meeting, it might need to be a part of your deal. And if there are concerns, we can talk about them. So, sorry to be so windy. That's, uh, that's what I have, but it is exciting. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Crenshaw? A lot on your plate. So. <laughs> no other items? All right, so next we have an uh, executive session for negotiations. How long do you think we need? Yes? Yes, can you do it? No, 30? 20? 
Mr. Kinshaw. <laughs> 30? Thank <laughs> you. 